Okay, so off we go. Uh, last time, uh, whoops, I'm on the wrong page. Uh, last time, uh, we were talking about the graph parameterization. We had just previously discussed the uh, this first example of how to parameterize a plane, which is really kind of a callback to Chapter One. But anyway, it's a it is a easy, nice starter first example of a surface parameterization. So uh, the big idea reminder of the graph parameterization is that the foot in the door, the thing that makes it work is that it is a graph that you have, you might say, solved for one of the variables in terms of the others. Right? And that was what made it work. That's what allows you to say, hey, I have input variables. I'm going to let those be the parameters. And what further allows you to say, well, then that kind of forces my hand that to the extent that S and T become X and Y, and X and Y are part of the formula for Z, then that tells me what Z has to be, right? So here's the uh, next observation. Um, you don't even have to have already solved for that variable. You just need to be able to solve for that variable. So uh, this example uh, here, we're looking at this equation, not written as a graph yet. Right? But we can. Uh, no problem. Uh, now, we, you'll try, by the way, perhaps first instinct. Uh, your first instinct might be to try to solve for Z. And, of course, you can't. Right? That's just, yeah, there's no algebraic tools for that. Can't solve for Z. Can't solve for X. But we can solve for Y. No problem. So, hadn't been viewing it as a graph, but I can view it as a graph. And... Having done so, again, uh, it's all over but the shouting. We identify what are my input variables. My input variables are X and Z. I make those be my parameters. And that, uh, again, kind of forces my hand. Um, if uh, S and T are X and Z, then Y kind of has to be so same, basically the same idea. You just you know note that uh, it might be the fact that something is a graph might be slightly hidden in how the question is phrased. Okay. All right. Next example, also kind of broadening. When I say you have to have solved for one of the coordinates in terms of the other two, it doesn't have to be a rectangular coordinate. Right. Um, here, uh, you'll notice I have what one might call a spherical graph. I've solved for one of the spherical variables in terms of the other two. Now, real quick, a lot of people would complain and say, this is not in terms of theta, and I would respond, yes, it is. It's just it depends on theta in a really, really boring way <laughs> in that it value of theta doesn't matter, right? Nevertheless, this is, boring though it may be, rho as a function of phi and theta. And as such, I can just take this formula now, instead of just kind of recopying it by changing the, the names of the parameters, I mean, after all, I, need, I do need this in rectangular coordinates. I have something that involves spherical coordinates, right? So there's going to be a conversion in here somewhere, and the, the way this plays out uh, is just uh, write down your typical conversion formulas. And again, just plug in for the variable that you've solved for, as you see I have right there. And check it out. Lo and behold, we have position as a function of now two parameters, phi and theta. Phi and theta themselves are our two parameters in this case. I don't have to make up new parameters, S and T. Happy? Real neat trick. By the way, this works for polar coordinates and cylindrical coordinates as well. Same basic idea. Okay. Okay, this next example, I'm going to pretty much skip. Uh, in the sense, this is a non-critical uh, example. You're not responsible uh, for it. I'm gonna, I guess I'm going to go ahead and just kind of cross this off. That said, it is a cool example, and um, yeah, it may not come up super often that this particular tool can be super useful, but it's a lot like, in a way, the bicycle wheel example that we saw back in chapter one when we were parameterizing curves. You all remember we had the little reflector on the bicycle wheel and it makes this weird pattern as it goes down the street. Um, the point to that bicycle wheel example was complex 
vectors sometimes are much more easily understood as the sum of two simpler vectors. And that's what's going on ultimately in this example, that uh, if you want to be able to parameterize this surface, you need to understand where those points are. And it might be that that's e more easily understood as a point that you understand on one surface plus a vector that you might understand in some other way. Right, and so a pretty easy case to make here, looking at this picture as, as whoops, as a, uh, there, there we go. That as I have it drawn, that uh, green plus blue gives you purple. Right, and so okay, turns out green's easy to solve for. Turns out blue is not that hard to solve for. And even though the purple point would have been hard to write down on its own, it's very easy to write it as green plus blue. So anyway, uh, you look at the details if you're interested. You don't have to. You're not responsible. Um, but uh, like I say, it's a good example. So uh, this one really is important. This, um, this next tool is uh, very, very commonly exactly what you need to be able to parameterize. So let's, let's entertain uh, this thing called the torus uh, here. Right, kind of a surface of a donut, if you will. Just a surface, not the not the gooey part on the inside, just the glaze on the outside, right? Okay. So, um, how would we parameterize this? Uh, it's not a plane. It's not a graph in any direction. I'm not going to be able to solve for either x or y or z. It's not nice in spherical coordinates or cylindrical coordinates. It's a problem. Right, but with our existing tools. So here's what I claim is uh, is the foot in the door. The foot in the door is to create a new tailored coordinate system, tailored just for the specifics of the surface in question. So let let's just you know talk about how how would I uh, <clears throat> if I want to talk about if I want to be able to describe that location somewhere on the surface of the torus, I guess I could write down x, y, and z coordinates, but this is a two-dimensional surface. I kind of feel like we should be able to describe that location with just two coordinates. I get to make up a tailored coordinate system, uh, and here's uh, what I think is a good choice. A really good new coordinate system just for the torus. Describe your point as follows. We're going to set a starting point I'm going to, for the purposes of my coordinate system, I'm going to set it up as this dark blue uh, point right there. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to say, okay, tell me by what angle do I need to rotate in, uh, as indicated, and then by what next angle, meaning that angle right there, uh, do I need to rotate in that other direction in order to get me to the purple point that I'm interested in, right? So again, if we take it as a given that that dark blue point is always the starting sort of reference point, there's kind of an upward angle and then a uh, horizontal angle as drawn. And any purple, any point on this entire torus, I can get to by this pair, two coordinates. Everybody see what I mean there? So I made this coordinate system just for the surface of the torus. And uh, <clears throat> I claim that this is going to be exactly what we need to be able to parameterize. Because after all, if you think about it, again, what is a parameterization? Parameterization means I need to have x, y, and z. I need to be able to solve, in other words, for location in terms of two parameters. And s and t are going to be my two parameters. So we just have to do the subsequent geometry. And I'll walk you through the, the, the how that broad strokes anyway of how that geometry works. But just playing a little bit of geometry will give us position as a function of parameters, those being the coordinates, and that is a parameterization. So big picture, does everybody see the plan? Okay. All right, so let's talk about the details now. Um, Okay, so, uh, oh, by the way, you're, you're going to notice uh, this uh, T, what I'm calling T here, it's, uh, it's a lot like latitude, sort of. And uh, this uh, S, that angle right there, eh, it's a lot like longitude, really. So, I mean, this isn't, 
<laughs> this is an entirely creative uh, coordinate system. I was kind of ripping off the idea of longitude and latitude, which again, if you think about it, is a tailor-made coordinate system for a surface. It's tailor-made, longitude and latitude were tailor-made for the surface of a sphere. So, same idea. Adapted. Okay, that noted. Uh, <clears throat> let's see here. So, first thing I'm going to have to do is uh, figure out where is uh, this point that I'm going to call P, namely what you get by rotating up as described there. Right, so how, what's the coordinates of that point? Um, I'm going to observe, and this is just, uh, uh, you know, just right there in the picture, that that orange point is, well, there's that purple vector, uh, and then apparently it would seem uh, plus this blue vector, and a little bit of trig will persuade you that that blue vector is what I have here. Now, again, uh, just a reminder, I'm going to assume you all are all strong with trig. Make sure that you are. A good test of that is, you know, are you comfortable thinking through, looking at that picture, looking at this blue vector that I have indicated here? Oh, gosh, I just trampled it. Uh, let me try to do better than that. Looking at that blue vector right there. You know, it's magnitude, you know, the little angle T, think about uh, unit circles and all that. Make sure you're comfortable how to take that geometry and conclude this algebra here. If you get stuck, if you're not sure, come talk to me in office hours. Happy to help, right? But let's make sure everybody's good with that. Okay, so the, uh, again, adding them up gives me this orange point uh, P. Okay, next... Um, <clears throat> how am I going to take this point P that we had just identified, right? We have a formula now for this point P. That's that point right there. How am I going to use that information to infer the point that I need, right? How am I going to find that purple point? And I hope this is a pretty believable idea. What I'm going to do to turn that orange point into that purple point is I'm just going to rotate around the z-axis, I, now, in order to do that, I need to understand, you know, what's the formula for how I rotate stuff by a given angle S? How do I rotate around the z-axis? And this is another geometry problem. Uh, rotations around an axis, a coordinate axis, certainly, any axis through the origin, but uh, a rotation around a coordinate axis uh, is a linear transformation, which means I can write it as a matrix which I can understand is its columns. Y'all have heard me say that a million times. Make sure you're good with that linear algebra that you can, again, do the appropriate trig, identify these three columns, and therefore, by way of the resulting linear algebra, conclude this matrix. And if you have any trouble, come to my office hours. Happy to help. I right? want to make sure everybody's solid with that linear algebra and trig. And now it's all over but the shouting. Uh, we found the that point right there, and then we just got through talking about how to rotate that around as needed, and we saw in the picture that doing that rotation would give us the point on the torus that we need, and you multiply that out, and you get this. Everybody good? Okay. All right. All right. Okay, next example. Again, another tool for your toolbox. Um, sometimes the thing you want to parameterize, you already have something that's close. Not quite, but close to what you're interested in. And so rather than starting over from nothing, rather than starting with a blank slate and having to create a parameterization uh, uh, from scratch, Right? Sometimes you can take the existing parameterization that you already have and just notice how to tweak it. So uh, here's a, a, an example of, uh, of this. So here we have uh, the unit sphere. And don't forget, we already have a parameterization of the unit sphere. This is the graph parameterization. Uh, excuse me, spherical graph parameterization. Again, you see right here, I've solved for one of my uh, uh, spherical coordinates. Play the game, plug that into the conversion formulas, just like we talked about at the start of this lecture. And that gives us 
this parameterization. Cool. All right, now what if I instead uh, find myself wanting to parameterize this ellipsoid? And uh, you'll uh, you'll notice or slash recall that uh, an ellipsoid, you know, it's it's actually really really closely connected to a sphere. Um, for one thing, you can see the very clear relationship in what their equations look like, right? Their equations, uh, other than just uh, basically some stretching, have very similar equations. Does that make sense? Okay. In fact, you can see exactly how much to stretch our existing parameterization. So uh, you can see that, well, x is uh, apparently replaced by x over a, yeah, so that's a stretch by a factor of a in the x direction. Likewise, we have a stretch by a factor of b in the y direction. And likewise, we have a stretch by a factor of c in the z direction. Okay, so how are we going to achieve those stretches? Well, a couple different ways you can do it. Uh, one thing you can do is take your existing parameterizations and just perform the exact same stretches by taking those equations and you play the stretching game. Here is how, as previously discussed, we stretch by a factor of a in the x direction. And replace x with x over a in the equation and that accomplishes stretching. And then likewise for y, likewise for z. So this, then, is one way to write some equations that, and of course, you've got to solve for x, y, and z, you know, move those factors to the right-hand side. But uh, that will effectively um, <clears throat> get you to the parameterization of the ellipsoid. Everybody see how that works? Now here's another way you can think about it. I think this is also reasonable. Uh, anyway, uh, we'll come back and talk about the difference between what I'm about to show you and what I just showed you. Another way you can stretch by a factor of a in the x direction, keeping in mind that this is what the x coordinates kind of start out as. If I want to stretch those by a factor of a, I'm just literally going to be making the x coordinates magnified by a factor of a, so I'm going to multiply them by a. Right? And so the new x coordinate, and keep in mind, that's what when we say this is a parameterization, what I mean is these are formulas for x, y, and z here. And notice my x coordinate is now bigger by a factor of a. As required. Yep. So you can just ignore the row because it's equal to one. That... It's not ignore. No, we're plugging in oh. the, that. I mean, it's a formula. Yeah, ignore just has some connotations I don't like, right? But yeah, we're just plugging in the formula row equals one into the conversion formulas, and effectively that makes the row kind of disappear off the page. That's right. Yeah. Are you good with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, now a lot of students get uncomfortable. They're like, wait a minute, uh, how come I, you just said we should divide? Now you're saying we should multiply. Which is it? Do you divide or do you multiply? And you have to keep track of what specifically are you doing. Here I'm doing a replacement. I'm not multiply. I'm not uh, dividing x coordinates by a. I'm dividing the variable in the equation by a. And that's effectively going to require the coordinate itself to be a times as big, right? So you got to remember there's something intrinsically kind of backwards uh, about this uh, point of view. You're undoing, right, in the algebra. So uh, anyway, keep that in mind. That is effectively multiplying x itself by a, uh, just like here. I am literally taking my formula for x and multiplying it by a. All right. Okay, so uh, there's several more examples in the book. Um, I do want to lodge a uh, complaint uh, about the examples that the book has. Not that there's anything wrong with them, but I feel like there's a shortcoming. And you're going to notice this in the book's examples. All of the book's examples start with an existing parameterization. They assume themselves the formula for the parameterization. And then they just say, okay, well, how do we interpret that geometrically? And that's useful, right? That's um, uh, one 
thing to do. For whatever it's worth, I think in practice, most of the time, what are y'all going to need when you get into engineering, right? And you find yourself looking at some surface and, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you, which way are you going to need to go? I think you're going to find that you start with, generally speaking, not a parameterization. You're going to start either with an equation or a geometric description or something like that, and you're going to need to create the parameterization, right? So what you're going to notice when you look at the book's examples, none of them, certainly not most of them, but if I remember correctly, none of them uh, that I saw actually show you how to create a parameterization. So that's why I focused on creation uh, here. Here we created a parameterization of an ellipsoid. Here we created a parameterization of a torus. Here y'all... I didn't do it, but uh, if you all want to look and, and read this, you'll see how to create a parameterization of that purple surface, et cetera, et cetera, creating, creating, creating. Um, I think that's what you're going to need most of the time. So the book's examples are fine, but they all have this kind of sort of shortcoming. Okay. All right. Okay, moving along. Um, so... Um, this next page is really just kind of showing the development of some ideas that are going to end up being familiar, kind of familiar. Um, there's a couple little details here. You don't want to overthink this stuff. Um, here's a parameterization of a surface. You can see two input parameters. So this is a two-dimensional thing, namely a surface. Um, there are two input variables. But if you were to fix one of those input variables, now you have, in fact, really only one acting input variable. You are therefore looking at uh, position uh, as a function of uh, uh, one variable. And position as a function of one variable is a parametric curve. Right? So this idea of if you just fix one of the inputs, then what that does is that creates a parametric curve inside of your original surface. Let's see an example uh, of this. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, let's uh, look at our unit sphere here. We've talked about that, this graph parameterization from row equals one. And I'm going to fix, just because, arbitrarily, I'm going to fix theta to be pi over 4, like so in the phi theta space. In other words, just looking at this line uh, here where theta is fixed at pi over 4. Now, I know what it looks like geometrically in XYZ space. If you fix theta to be pi over 4, it gives you a theta cross-section, and that theta cross-section, of course, is going to be sort of kind of like that. And so now, again, I, I claim we have a curve in the sense that as phi increases, and again, looking at that picture, looking on the x, y, z picture and thinking about on that slice where theta is constant, what happens as phi increases? Well, you kind of move down south, you might say, uh, on the sphere uh, like so. So that's called the phi coordinate curve because phi on that curve is the parameter that's describing how that curve moves. Okay, all right. So that, that's all it is. Um, now, next observation, and this again, this is uh, this next observation is mostly a matter of language. Um, <clears throat> this seems like a much more substantial statement than it is, but I make the modest observation that. The velocity of one of these coordinate curves is a partial derivative. Now let me talk you through. The, this is just language play. That's all it is. Just language play. Uh, <clears throat> so let's. I, I, I'm claiming that these are the same thing. When you form one of these coordinate curves, how do you form one of these coordinate curves? Will you? pick one of the input variables and you set it equal to a constant. That's how we formed a coordinate curve. In the example we showed, right, it was theta that we set equal to a constant. How do we take the velocity? Velocity is the derivative of the parametric curve. 
right? Now let me just say that a little bit differently. Same same ideas, different phrasing. We're going to take a parametric surface. We're going to fix one of the input variables and then take the derivative with respect to the other input variable. And that is practically word for word how we describe partial derivatives way back when, back in, uh, in, uh, in chapter 2. So like I say, modest observation. Notice, in other words, in fact, the velocities of these coordinate curves are literally just partial derivatives. So there's a nice upshot there, uh, having made this observation. If I know what the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, x um, coordinate curve uh, with respect to phi, right? If I know the phi coordinate curve, then I can talk about its resulting velocity. That right there is my x phi. And it's telling me how fast, you know, my velocity as I'm moving south, as we as we discussed, right, on the phi coordinate curve. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> now remember, uh, uh, velocity is a kind of a derivative. Derivative is a relationship between input changes and output changes. And so, modest observation, um, given some differential change in phi, multiplication by the derivative gives me the resulting output change in position x. Right, so the derivative is the relationship between input changes and output changes. In this case, it's what you multiply by the input change d phi to get the output change, you might call it dx. All right, now we observe, uh, looking at this picture right here, uh, <clears throat> if you've got a, a dx in the phi direction and correspondingly there's a dx in the theta direction, then you have both of the edges of a, a little, a little uh, sort of uh, rectangular-ish, in this case, coincidental, uh, looking little piece of area output piece of area on the sphere. In particular, that's what relates to this input piece of area that came from the d phi and d theta. And so now there's some details to be worked out, but I have the, I have the, the layout now of how I can see input areas and output areas that come from this surface parameterization. And y'all can probably see this coming parameterization, input size, output size, we're going to be doing pullbacks. So we're going to need to understand the stretching factor. So I'm going to, I'm going to need to compute the output area in blue, relate it to the input area there in green, and figuring out how much does this parameterization stretch areas. Yeah. So some you know details ensue. It's uh, not uh, such a bad thing, uh, really. We've already talked about these vectors, right? I've talked. Oh, let me make good color choices. Uh, we've talked about this edge right there. That's x phi d phi. Uh, we've talked about that edge right there. That's x theta d theta. Uh, we're interested in computing this blue area right there. Whoa, that's a parallelogram floating in space, flashback to chapter one. If you want to compute the area of a parallelogram in space, that area is the magnitude of the cross product of the edge vectors. And that's all over by the shouting at this point because, of course, uh, you'll notice that uh, these scalar factors, uh, d phi and d theta, those are both scalars. They factor right out thus leaving me only with this other expression right here. Uh, and as we had hoped, we have related input area to output area, and the amount that we stretch the input to get the output is that formula right there. This is our surf uh, surface parameterization stretching factor. What do you think? 
All right, so that's gonna this little formula right here is gonna play a very big role in a lot of things we'll be doing over the next uh, gosh what a uh, week. <laughs> right, not much time. But uh, anyway, this is going to be one of the big players. Uh, so uh, this being as it is a big player, uh, the vector in question in here, the thing whose magnitude I'm talking about, uh, deserves a name and a notation. So uh, we're going to call this the parametrized normal vector. And I'm going to use the letter capital N to denote it. That's actually, uh, I don't want to say a standard, but it's a very common choice. Uh, this is the the norm. Oh, by the way, let's observe it's a normal vector, right? It's a cross product of two tangent vectors. So it's got to be a normal vector. And that's the normal vector that comes out of the parameterization and whose magnitude is our stretching factor. So um, with that notation set up, uh, we see that our stretching factor is uh, the magnitude, don't forget the magnitude of course, it's the magnitude uh, of that parametrized normal vector. Cool, uh, I, all I've done is establish a notation and a name. Nothing really happened right there. Everybody all right? Okay. Real quick terminology thing. Um, uh, I like to call this the, uh, let's see here, uh, uh, I like to call this the parametrized normal vector because, check it out, it comes from the parameterization. It's telling me something very important about what the parameterization is doing. So I think parameterized normal vector or parameterization normal vector, I could see that as well. That seems like the logical choice to me for what to call this. Um, for whatever it's worth, uh, the book prefers to call, th call this the standard normal vector. Now, okay, it's just terminology. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. But I will point out a downside to this terminology. Calling it the standard normal vector makes it sound like it's intrinsic to the surface. It's the standard. It's not intrinsic to the surface. It comes from the parameterization. Every surface has loads of parameterizations. That's a lot of them. They're arbitrary. You can parameterize things every which way. So I just I get a little uncomfortable with the word standard. You could make the case that it's the standard formula from the parameterization, but I feel like this is going to get misinterpreted as saying it's a standard for the surface, which it's not. Right. So anyway, uh, that's uh, the, you're going to see that terminology, and that's why I don't care for it myself. Okay. All right. So let's do one. Let's compute a surface area. Uh, here, I'm going to do that real quick. Uh, let's compute the surface area of the unit sphere. And uh, now, just big picture, we know that but we've already established that I'm going to compute the area of the sphere by breaking it up into little pieces, the whole is the sum of the parts. Uh, we've already computed that each little output area relates to the little input areas by way of the stretching factor that we just computed, right? Magnitude of capital N. We're going to have to do uh, some labor to <laughs> get to, to see what that stretching factor actually works out to be. But big picture, chop it up, add it up, and realize that each little piece of the surface area that we chopped it up into is just a stretched out rectangle, d phi d theta. And then there'll be a subsequent calculation. Okay, so let's focus then on the stretching factor. How are we going to figure out what this stretching factor is? Let me put a question mark on that. How are we going to compute that? We have our formula, right? Capital N, right there. I've got to compute the partials of my parameterization. I've got to take the cross product. And then I've got to take the magnitude to get my stretching factor. So three-step process, and here we go. Uh, by the way, when I say we, I mean you. Here's what y'all are gonna do, and I've, I've indicated the little checkpoints here to make sure that you're doing the right thing as you go along, but notice the first thing that you're gonna need to do is make sure that you're comfortable seeing how that these are the partial derivatives. 
right? We've got our, our uh, unit sphere parameterization, same one. Take the partials. That's what you get. Next, we've got to take those partials and we've got to cross them. And I've left out a significant amount of trig there. Everybody should do this once in their life. So give it a shot. I mean, it's just trig, right? It's not that scary. Um, and then now, having taken that cross product, now that we know our capital N vector, uh, keep in mind the last step is to take the magnitude. And again, you notice the the yada 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 right there. Uh, <clears throat> again, that's for that's for y'all to do. Everybody should do it once in their life. It's not as hard as it looks. Pythagorean identity is awesome. It's going to come up several times in that calculation. So uh, spend a couple minutes, and uh, what you'll find is that that magnitude simplifies very nicely as just sine phi. So that's uh, the next step here in this calculation. Right? We just plug in this formula for this stretching factor that we just computed. And it's all over with the shouting. Um, mm, so uh, yeah, this integral, super easy. Bada bing, bada boom. There it is. Four pi is the answer. Make sure, make sure you can do that too. But that's that's easy. All right. Okay. So just uh, I like to have summary pages where all the players are there on the on the stage, and uh, this is all the players that we were just involved and in, where they sit and what they look like. Uh, so we have a parameterization of our surface. Uh, we look at little pieces of input areas and speculate about their resulting image output areas. Uh, we look at uh, the input parameters, and then there are correspondingly the output partials, and argument that we've already made uh, has us compute the capital N vector, which, uh, for reasons that you'll see coming up pretty soon here, actually, is sometimes conveniently written as a direction and a magnitude. In that direction, the unit vector pointing uh, perpendicular to the surface is uh, is this little n. Okay, so that's uh, that's all the that's a you know super brief summary of what we just talked through. Um, <clears throat> all I'm going to do now. <laughs> is just point out that you can take this formula, very compact and convenient little formula for uh, capital N, and you can write it out in coordinates. Nothing happened there. I just wrote it out in coordinates. And now, modest observation, if I'm taking a cross product and I have the coordinates, I can crank that out. And uh, the surprising um, result we get to is that when you're looking at the capital N vector, let's just do it like this now, the capital N vector has this surprising trait that its coordinates are all two-dimensional stretching factors. That's weird. This is not a two-dimensional change of variables. We're going from two dimensions to three dimensions. There's no two-dimensional change of variables that we see, that we've noticed in this picture. How come two-dimensional change of variables are figuring very prominently in this major player, capital N? Again, I, just, I, I think this is an eyebrow raiser. I think it's weird. You should be highly suspicious that there's uh, a really natural underlying way to look at this that would explain what seems like too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. And in fact, there is There's a really good reason that these come up like this. And it's a beautiful argument that we don't have time for. And so uh, I'm not going to be able to tell you. Sorry about that. If you want to hear that cool argument, come to office hours. I'll be very happy to walk you through it. It's a 15-minute conversation. Okay. Tops. Okay. All right, now a uh, uh, cute little uh, uh, corollary, I guess you might say, to uh, what we've been doing. Um, it, it, something really convenient happens in a special case. So keep in mind the, this formula that we've got up here for our stretching factor, magnitude of capital N, this works for any parameterized surface, but it turns really nice when you're looking specifically at a graph 
and specifically that you are using the graph parameterization that results like so. It's just, there's a really nice little punchline. So I encourage you, even though this is the general formula, and you do have to make sure that you remember the general formula, because not everything will be graphs. It just won't be. Yes? For the second column, do we not need a negative sign? I already, uh, your great question. Uh, it, yeah, I've already sort of made that happen by putting the Z and the X in sort of the opposite order. Yeah, so there's a little detail devil that, uh, that you, know, you but you're right. There is a minus sign and there it is. Um, now, um, yeah, depending on, anyway. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. Okay, so uh, not every surface is a graph. Make sure you know the general formulas can't assume that everything will be a graph. It certainly won't be. But when you are looking at a graph, and when you do use the graph parameterization, well, this is the formula for the graph parameterization. The partials just will be these. That's how you take the partials of that formula. The cross product straight up will be that every time. Punch it up yourself. That's just how, how this plays. The magnitude, a.k.a. the stretching factor, magnitude of that capital N is going to be that. That's just what it is. So this is a handy formula to know, and I encourage you to memorize this formula. Again, this is only if you're using a graph parameterization specifically. That formula is your stretching factor. And so if you have that memorized, that saves you having to compute some partials, compute a cross product, compute a magnitude, etc. This just gets right, right to the point. And it's even better than that uh, <clears throat> in a way that can be useful sometimes. Just noticed this is the magnitude squared of the gradient, isn't it? That's cool. Oh, wait a minute. The magnitude of the gradient tells you how steep the graph is. So, cool fact. Uh, <clears throat> when you're looking at a graph parameterization, or when you're looking at a graph, we should say, the stretching factor only depends on how steep the graph is. If you know how steep the graph is, it doesn't really matter what the formula is. If steepness is all you need, and that's a really neat fact, right? Sometimes the steepness is all you have, and the formula would be a super big pain. Uh, and so knowing that the, that the eventual stretching factor you need only depends on steepness and is always specifically in this way, again, when you're talking about a graph, super handy. So uh, my favorite example of this is uh, to let's talk about uh, how would we compute the area of the roof here. Uh, let's see here, golly. Okay, I think that's, yeah, there we go. So here's the roof. Um, and maybe, uh, why, do, who would, why do you need the area of a roof? What are the odds? Well, when you become a homeowner, uh, what you're going to notice is that uh, roofs are very expensive. <laughs> and uh, I mean, the $10,000, $15,000, I mean, it's wow, right? It's a lot. And you don't want to accidentally overpay by 15%. <laughs> accidentally. Right, right. You don't want the the roofers to oopsie. Uh, you know, coincidentally, always in their favor. Uh, <clears throat> so, how do you protect yourself from that? How do you make sure that you are not paying too much for the the shingles? And they're gonna they're gonna cite. Okay, here you know the formula for how many shingles you need is uh, the following formula from based on the area. And so you need to know how to be able to compute the area of your roof. Now, how are you going to do that? Well, you could take this as a high school geometry problem, and you could say, well, I guess I'll compute the area of that triangle, and you're going to have to get up onto the roof then and with a tape measure and measure that, right, and measure this and hope you don't fall off, right? Uh, that's a scary thought. Uh, and then you're going to have to do that not just for that face, but also for that one, and also for that one, and also for that one. Oh, and here's an annoying thing. Um, 
<sighs> That's uh, not necessarily a right triangle, so you're going to have a little bit of geometry to do. And I'm just saying, there's a bunch of details to be done there, and that's that's a that's an unappetizing prospect. The roof of my house is like 30 feet off the ground or something. It's, it's scary, and I'm not going up there. Okay. So, well, here's the beautiful observation. That roof is a graph, isn't it? So I can view that as just basically using a graph parameterization. I can view the pullback as being the footprint. How do I compute the area of the footprint? Easy. Tape measure, walking along the perimeter of the house. It's all rectangles. Up to it. Not, not a problem at all. So that footprint's easy to compute. Um, the other thing, of course, that you're going to need is you're going to need to know your stretching factor. And as previously discussed, our stretching factor is that right now. It only depends on the steepness. And here's an odd but very convenient fact about roofs of houses. A little bit of a digression, I know. But many cases, I think it's fair to say in most cases, house roof pitches are uniform over the entire roof. So all you need is one measurement that you can get in your attic. And that is just measure sort of the rise and the run in uh, sort of uh, any part of your roof right there in your attic. Perfectly safe. Um, you know that pitch. Uh, that pitch then it tells you that... Um, uh, that pitch is uh, the steepness. Uh, that is what you plug into this formula to compute your stretching factor. And if that steepness is constant, well, then that means the stretching factor is a constant. Constants factor right outside of integrals. And look at this handy-dandy, convenient little uh, punchline formula um, right here. This is computed without ever having to climb a ladder. That saves you loads of trouble. And the non-trivial possibility will save you loads of money. Everybody good? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so moving along. Uh, surface integrals. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Yeah, that is good. Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, Y'all remember line integrals. Actually, you know what I was, I was going to do and then I forgot. Uh, bear with me just a minute here. I'm going to pull up uh, the chapter six notes because I want to do some comparing. Just a minute. Okay, let's see here. I got to do that. Uh, sorry, bear with me a moment. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a little side by side comparison. Okay, um, yeah, okay, here we go. So, uh, <clears throat> previously, we talked about uh, what if you have a curve in the plane or a curve in space, and it's dimensionally awkward. The thing itself is one-dimensional. The space it lives in is higher dimensional. Well, same thing happens with a surface. Whoops. Uh, let me, let me, uh, oh. How do I find the colors? Ah! I didn't. Man, I'm going to have to do that. That's annoying. Uh, sorry. Ah! There we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, same situation over here. We have a surface uh, in space, which, again, lower dimension than the world it lives in. It's not one dimensional in a two-dimensional th world, it's two-dimensional in a three-dimensional world. But it's still sort of dimensionally out of place. So still, how would I make an accumulation argument on one of these surfaces? Can I just call it a double integral? No. Double integral assumes that you're in the plane. We're clearly not in the plane. A double integral <laughs> would not represent how the surface is kind of curving around and stuff, and that's going to matter. Right? <coughs> 
Can I call it a triple integral? No, there's no volume. We're looking at a surface. It's intrinsically two-dimensional. There's no volume to talk about. So again, we find ourselves in a situation where we just don't have the right tool. Uh, and so what did we do back here? Well, we said chop it up, add it up. So over here, I'm going to likewise, I'm going to say, well, how about the chop it up, add it up. And in particular, we're going to be uh, taking um, our entire area, chopping it into little smaller pieces of area. And on each little piece of area, I'm going to argue that whatever my stuff is, whatever it is I want to compute on that little piece of area, stuff is stuff per unit area times area. Now, what stuff are we talking about? I'm deliberately leaving that open, right, so that this can apply as broadly as possible. Uh, maybe we have mass distributed over that surface. We want to find the total amount of mass. Fine, then on each piece, mass is mass per unit area times area. Right? What if there's ants crawling all over this surface, and I want to count the total number of ants? Okay, well, on any given little piece of area, ants are ants per unit area times area. Right? It, this applies to any accumulating quantity, any quantity that's accumulating over that surface. Is that cool? So uh, <clears throat> it's just ripping off the idea of a Riemann sum. It's ultimately not even that new of an idea. It's just kind of the old idea applied to a new context. But nevertheless, the details being different, this is a new kind of Riemann sum, and so we're going to call this a new kind of an integral. And I hope it comes as no surprise that this being a surface, we're going to call this a surface integral. And you might not be terribly surprised that because this being surface area is a scalar and this being a density is a scalar perhaps not terribly surprising that it is a we're going to call it a scalar surface integral just like over here uh, we call this a scalar line integral is that cool? okay so again we're just we're, we're taking old ideas and we're adapting to a new circumstance, but it's basically just those same old ideas. Okay. All right. Now, how do we compute these things? Uh, how did we compute these things? Well, we noticed that the curve we were interested in was an image if it's parameterized. So we need to parameterize the curve. Okay, fine. Now, is there what, what's the a version of that over here? Well, I can, as we've just been discussing, parameterize the surface. Now that makes that an image. Yeah? Um, just like happened over here, I mean, we already had a, a, a bunch of... Uh, objects identified and notations and names and relationships. I mean, we've studied parameterizations uh, previously, and now, as of uh, very recently, we have studied surface parameterizations, right? So I'm just going to import, you know, copy, paste. In fact, if I had to guess, I would bet that all... Oh, gosh. Hang on. I would bet that all of this is probably straight up copy pasted from previous in my notes, right? It's just copy, nothing new here, right? And notice, I already have what I need. I need to know how much area there is, ds, and in a little piece of my surface. And I'd like to rewrite that in terms of ds dt, which is my little input area. So I just need to multiply by my stretching factor, uh, my stretching factor, of course, which I've already computed. So I stick it on in there, right? And that allows me to rewrite my ds as magnitude capital N times ds dt. We already had it. It's not even new. Everybody good? 
And then, of course, the only other thing that's happening is I'm going to have to take my formulas uh, uh, for uh, X, Y, and Z in terms of S and T and just you know plug in those formulas for X, Y, and Z in terms of S and T. So, uh, in other words, plug in the pullback. Okay, so that's it. And let's see, uh, well, we're going to get to some examples in just a quick moment. Uh, I do want to point out that just like we had, oh, I guess I should, uh, oops, what did I just do? Uh, oh, gosh. Um, uh, there we go. Okay, so just like we had with, uh, with line integrals, we have to worry about whether or not the parameterization might make a difference. With, with scalar line integrals, parameterization doesn't matter at all. Equivalently, conveniently, ditto for scalar surface integrals. So parameterize however you like. Doesn't matter. Go crazy. Whatever you like. Whatever makes your life easiest, uh, parameterize that way. Okay, so uh, now again, just like we did back in Chapter 6, my first example is actually four examples. Just to kind of underscore how uh, everything depends on the parameterization. And so whether you're computing mass or center of mass, here's the x-coordinate and y-coordinate down there, or um, uh, moment of inertia around some axis, whatever, again, down further. Whatever it is that you're computing, yeah, fine. Most of it, though, after you've written down your initial sort of uh, Riemann sum breakdown, it's just a matter of using the same formulas. So we're talking in this example about the several aspects of the same surface with the same mass distribution giving us a density, parameterizing with the same parameterization, which I do the same calculation to get the same stretching factor, right? All of that is shared by all four of these examples here. All right. Um, so now, again, it's very plug and chug, so I'm going to let y'all uh, do most of the reading through on this. Of course, mass is mass per unit area times area. Um, as we just saw, ds is stretching factor times d phi d theta. There's that same stretching factor, magnitude of capital N. Right? And then just don't forget, cleaning up the mess first, but uh, don't forget that the parameterization is what tells you uh, how to plug in in the resulting, uh, in the resulting formula. So for example, uh, keeping in mind that these are your formulas for X, Y, and Z. And so, for example, right here, you can see right there, it says Z is cosine phi. So, Z, cosine phi. That Z, cosine phi. Uh, let's see here. X, sine phi, cosine theta. Okay, that X right there, sine phi, cosine theta. I'm just plugging in straight out of the parameterization. And that gives you... Um, uh, iterated integrals that you can plug and chug. Everybody happy? Okay. All right, so there's a really nice kind of happy answer uh, to uh, how do we deal with a uh, surface integral. You realize that it's an image of a parameterization. You compute the stretching factor. You pull back. It's very plug and chug. All right, now next question. Now I'm going to go back to the uh, comparison here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let me get, get this all lined up so it'll look good on the page. Uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, so in chapter 6, we tried to adapt our idea of uh, scalar line integral to compute work. But ultimately, the problem was that work is computed by way of a formula that involves a dot product because the participants are really more naturally understood as vectors. It's a really a vector question instead of a scalar question. And so we ultimately had to develop this new idea called a vector line integral. Okay, well, there's a different sort of physical scenario over here, but we're going to here be interested in... Uh, 
flux. <coughs> oh, let me get into the highlighter mode. Flux. Different physical question. Right? If flux isn't work, work isn't flux. Work is about forces, not fluids. Right? Fluids are about the, the movement of uh, some stuff. There's no forces involved. They're completely different physical scenarios. But uh, what you'll notice is they do have this common feature. They're both involving a dot product of what really fundamentally need to be viewed as vectors. And so, uh, as you might expect, we're going to need to adapt the idea of a... Um, uh, of a scalar surface integral, and we're going to have to develop something that's going to be called a vector surface integral to compute flux. And it's going to be very, very analogous. You can see a lot of this kind of coming. Uh, you know, So here we have this curve that you see is not flat, right? And our vector field is not constant. But when you chop it up into little pieces... Right on any given little piece, um, yeah, it's uh, approximately straight and it's very small. So the force uh, is approximately constant, and therefore you can write down little nice convenient things like this. So that's exactly what's going to happen over here. Um, so if we want to compute flux, and quick reminder, why do we care about flux? Well, it's because it represents natural things like. Uh, volume per unit time of flow or quantity per unit time of flow, depending on what your vector field is, right? But very natural thing. Um, how are we gonna? How does that break down for this situation here? Well, I'm gonna take my surface and break it up into little pieces, on each of which it's basically flat, and it's really small, and so the flow is. Yeah, pretty close to constant. Okay. All right, now, uh, there is the uh, same asterisk that we had to worry about when we were talking about, oh, excuse me, when we were talking about uh, vector line integrals. Uh, the asterisk was that uh, it depends on which direction you're going, right? If you're computing the amount of work it takes to hike that trail, uh, it's more work to hike it uphill than it is to hike it downhill, right? And so likewise, over here, if I want to know flow rate, if I want to know, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, to what extent is this fluid flowing through this surface? Well, do you mean in this direction? Like, is this what we're going to call the positive direction through the surface? Because if so, then as I have it drawn here, it looks like uh, all of that fluid to some extent or another is flowing kind of in that direction. And so, yeah, we're going to have a positive amount of flow through this surface. But if I were to just change my convention perfectly free to decide, you know what, I'm going to consider this downward direction to be what I'm going to call the correct or the the uh, the uh, positive. Right, this is the direction through the surface that I'm actually interested in for whatever reason. Oh well, now all the fluids going the opposite direction, right? So so you have to decide which question are you asking. Are you asking uh, for the flow rate in uh, what you might in this case call downward through the surface? Or are you interested in the flow rate upward through the surface? And the choice is indicated by what we call an orientation, which is indicated by unit vectors perpendicular to the surface. Okay. By the way, this uh, this is called the uh, the orientation unit normal. Um, <clears throat> you uh, might be tempted just to call it the unit normal, right? Why wouldn't we just call it the unit normal? I'm going to leave that hanging as a, uh, uh, you know, for dramatic purposes. Uh, it turns out that uh, that's we, we need to clarify, and this specifically is telling us the orientation on the surface, and uh, I, I, we're going to need to have that. Uh, but anyway, I'll leave that again for dramatic purposes. Okay. All right, so proceeding along, uh, on each little piece, uh, this is an easy question. Uh, on each little piece, we have a certain amount of area. D, 
ds. And we have a formula for how to compute flux on a basically flat piece of surface with a basically constant vector field, right? F dot in ds. So this is my little piece of uh, flux. And I just have to add that up over all the pieces. Is everybody with me? Everybody see the strategy and how we're uh, structuring this this uh, this attempt? All right. Okay, so there you go. Um, the whole is the sum of the parts. The grand total flux is the sum of all the little pieces of flux when you break the surface up. Uh, we just computed that d phi is f dot n d s right there. And so here's your answer. Right there. And at a, at a glance, it kind of looks like a scalar surface integral because, after all, this is area uh, that is a scalar, and uh, this is a dot product, and that is a scalar. Uh, but uh, it really, it looks pretty weird. This, this, I, I feel like this is concealing what's truly going on. I mean, for example, you cannot compute this at all without having made a choice about which direction is the positive direction through your surface. The orientation is essential for being able to make sense out of that. That is not the case for any of these calculations right here. You want to compute the mass? There is no upward mass and downward mass, right? It's just it's just numbers. Add them up. Add them up in whatever order you like. Who cares? Right? So there is something fundamentally different about what's going on here, and I like to uh, magnify and uh, underscore that um, by <coughs> taking these two factors, grouping them together, and I call it the ds vector right there and that might seem like a weird thing to do I will point out that uh, <clears throat> this is actually pretty natural if you think about it um, after all both the normal vector and the ds differential are telling me information about my piece of surface Right? So, I mean, they, they really kind of naturally belong together. Case could be made anyway. Um, also, I just like the fact that this looks visibly different from the way we write scalar surface integrals. And why do I like it for it to look different? Well, because it is different. And when things are different, I think it's important that they not be conflated. And, and making the notations look indistinguishable conflates the difference. But the difference matters. So anyway, that's a personal feeling. Has uh, <clears throat> uh, different points of view on that, but uh, uh, anyway, I, I tend to like this notation right here. But just keep in mind, it's just uh, shorthand, you might say, for this. Okay, how we doing? You can see now why we call this a vector surface integral. My differential is in fact a vector. My integrand also now you can see is a vector. So different name, different notation for a fundamentally different answer to a fundamentally different question. Okay. All right. Okay. How do we compute these things? Here's all this old news again. In fact, let me uh, do it like so. All of this is all recopy. Here's that parameterization business that we talked about a ways back. Here's the uh, development we just got through talking about seconds ago. Right? That's just recopies for convenience of access. And there's a, just kind of one little move to be done here. Well, sort of two little moves. Uh, don't forget we have this formula for the DS scalar. Just plug in that little formula for the ds scalar. And now, look at this. And by the way, full confession, I'm about to commit a math crime. I will confess 
my math crime later for dramatic purposes. For the moment, I want to commit and try to get away with my little math crime. Try and catch me. I hope you do. Uh, <laughs> again, if you don't, I will confess it later. But let's look at this right here. Um, <clears throat> we got little n that points in the direction perpendicular to the surface. So does capital N. So little n points in the same direction as capital N. Now let's think about uh, this factor right here. Uh, that's the magnitude of capital N. It's also the magnitude of this product. This product points in the same direction as capital N, has the same magnitude as capital N. Vectors are characterized by their direction and magnitude. This looks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Isn't it a duck? Right? Tempting, then, to say it's capital N. The crime has been committed. Ah, we'll come, I'll come back and uh, confess to the crime later. Um, <clears throat> so, um, for the moment, the reason that I'm sweeping the crime under the rug for the moment is that there's already a lot going on, right? We've got a brand new kind of a construction with brand new notation, uh, brand new uh, uh, various things, brand new formulas, and I, I just kind of want to I want to take what we just concluded, namely that flux can be computed with this new construction that can be computed with this parametrized formula, and I just want to get one in the win column. I just want to finish an example. Let's get an answer. See how the mechanics of this works pretty much, and then uh, we'll, we'll fine-tune the little subtlety that I just swept under the rug in a, in a, in a few minutes or, or, or next week. <laughs> we'll see about the clock. I don't know how we're going to make it on time. Um, yeah, it's probably going to be next week. Okay, so here we go. Let's just do this example. We'll call it a day. A uh, question asked me to compute the flux. Flux is going to be a vector surface integral. Vector surface integrals are computed with that formula we just derived. So that part is already done. Uh, we're going to need to know capital N. And right there, right? How am I going to find my capital N? Well, uh, we play the usual game. Um, I have a surface. I got to parametrize. I got to take the partials. I got to compute the cross product. That's my formula for my capital N vector, right? So uh, I just swept a bunch of details. Make sure you can do follow all the details. Check me on the on the algebra, etc. Uh, so that's my that's my capital N. And everything else is just a matter of plugging in. Uh, you got to be careful about this. Uh, our vector field, it says right here, my first coordinate of my vector field is z squared. I'm going to need to figure out how to rewrite z squared. Well, wait a minute. How am I going to rewrite z squared? I need to know what z is. Don't forget, the parametrization is what tells you what your coordinates are. And it's so, therefore, it says right here, in fact, that's what z is. Z is S squared plus T squared. And so that Z is S squared plus T squared. So Z squared is that squared, like so. Is that cool? So just don't forget the parameterization tells you how to do your plugging in. Uh, likewise for the other coordinates. And uh, so we have it down now to a iterated integral. And, of course, you all know how to compute those. Everybody happy? Okay. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> let's see. How are we doing on time? Uh, come on. Eh, it's not quite time, but you know what? We're at the end of a page, and I'm sure I owe you all time, so we're going to go ahead and call it a day right here. We will pick up here on Monday, and you all have a great weekend. See you later. Oh, and don't forget about attendance, of course. Uh, stick around if you need to.